In episode 1, I presented various reasons as to why a deeper investigation into the ancestry of Emperor Vespasian has taken place. The first reason was that the Jewish war, written by a man known as Flavius Josephus, was written during the same period as the Gospels, that is the period after the Roman Jewish war. The second reason concerned the plethora of parallels and correlations which combined total over 60 between the Gospels and Josephus' Jewish Antiquities and Jewish War. The third reason concerns the genealogy of Josephus, which has caused much trouble for scholars, mainly because what Josephus writes about his supposed ancestry does not make sense when examining the family tree of Herod the Great, of which Josephus claims descent. Even Canadian historian Steve Mason, regarded as an authority on Josephus, has had trouble deciphering his genealogy. The fourth reason is that when investigating sources detailing the Herodian and Flavian families, in an attempt to unravel Josephus' genealogy, suspicious similarities emerge between Vespasian's maternal grandfather, Vespasius Pollio, and one of Herod the Great's grandsons, Herod Pollio, such as dates and ages and other connections that link to what has been investigated. Herod Pollio is linked to a king of Armenia, called Tigranes VI, whose wife is named as Op Galli, or Gali. Galli, of which, can be Gala, meaning the same as Pollio, which means cock, chicken, or rooster. Emperor Vespasian's mother, in the historical record, is named as Vespasia Polla, the feminine form of Pollio. In part one, we appeared to have identified a son and daughter for both Vespasius Pollio, Emperor Vespasian's maternal grandfather, and Herod Pollio, grandson of Herod the Great, all of which were active within elite circles in the same period. If Vespasius Pollio was Herod Pollio, then some blanks in the historical data can be filled in. For example, it would provide details about the children of Vespasius Pollio and give the names of his wife or wives. As in the historical record, the names of any wives of Vespasius Pollio are not given. It would also show his brother to have been King Agrippa I, which would explain why both King Agrippa II and Emperor Vespasian apparently born in 9 CE, according to Suetonius, would have a physical family resemblance, as seen on the royal coinage. This would be because if Vespasius Pollio was Herod Pollio, then Emperor Vespasian and King Agrippa II would share the same common ancestry, which would be their descent from King Herod the Great, as King Agrippa II was the son of King Agrippa I, brother of Herod Pollio. King Agrippa II, therefore, would be Emperor Vespasian's first cousin once removed and great uncle on Vespasian's mother's side. I feel it is necessary to say that critical information regarding the emperors and the aristocracy of Rome oftentimes seems to have been left out of the historical record. But the reason critical information was not given seems to be because revealing those genealogies would reveal the connection to other royals, that is, their royal lineage. But why would they want to hide their lineage? We must understand that the nobility was in control of everything including the writing of religious literature, histories, stories, and who would rule. If the common people 
who vastly outnumbered the aristocracy, had become aware of what was happening, in terms of them being manipulated by an oligarchy, connected by blood, royalty would have been killed and their whole system overturned for a mass revolution, which was the precise situation happening in Judea. The same elite family circles kept their rule by only providing certain information to the public. To maintain their control and continue living very comfortably, the elite had to hide the fact that they were the only ones creating published writing. They were the only ones educated to a standard high enough to create the kind of prose seen in histories and religious texts that were produced. Essentially, the majority of the people of the Roman Empire only knew what the aristocracy allowed them to know. Exposing Vespasius Pollio as a pseudonym of Herod Pollio would show Vespasius as a king and therefore his and his descendants' right to rule. If the name Vespasius was a pseudonym, understanding a possible reason as to why it was chosen is a good idea. Regarding pseudonyms, Scottish-American classicist Gilbert Hyatt remarked in Juvenal the Satirist, page 291, that it is suggested, therefore, that some of the names in Juvenal's topical references are cover names only, which have merely a metrical correspondence, and perhaps also a faint similarity in sound, to the name of the real person known to Juvenal and his audience. And in the introduction to the epistles of Pliny the Younger, we read, it has been suggested that, in his choice of pseudonyms, Juvenal satirises some of Pliny's correspondence. It is known that ancient royals used titles as part of names. For example, Ptolemy Soter, a title bestowed upon many monarchs, is a Greek form of the Egyptian god title Ta Mes Soter, meaning Son of God the Saviour, Mes meaning Son of, and Soter meaning Saviour. In the Acts of the Apostles, 1220 in the New Testament, we read, Was and Herod in bitter hostility with the Tyrians and Sidonians, but with one accord they came to him, and having gained Blastus, who was over the bedchamber of the king, sought peace, because was nourished their country by the kings. Acts is stating here that the people of these cities asked the king for peace, because they received food supplies from his country. Therefore, Acts is informing us of relations between King Herod Pollio of Chalcis and the population of Tyre and Sidon, two Lebanese cities. Chalcis was situated under Mount Libanus, modern Mount Lebanon, and two types of coins for him were found mainly in the Lebanon area. Commentators on the New Testament have identified the Herod being spoken of in Acts 12.20 as being Agrippa I, brother of Herod Pollio. However, we are in the dark as to why these cities would be in conflict with Agrippa, enough to ask for peace. When analysing what is presented in Acts and comparing the information given in Antiquities, in which Josephus appears to conflate Herod Chalcis with others, it appears a mistake has been made. The events described in Acts 11.27-12.23 to are as follows. And in these days came down from Jerusalem prophets to Antioch, and having risen up one from among them, by name Agabus, he signified by the Spirit 
a famine great is about to be over the whole habitable world, which also came to pass under Claudius Caesar. And the disciples, according as was prospered anyone, determined each of them for ministration to send to the dwelling in Judea brethren, which also they did, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And at that time put forth Herod the king his hands to ill-treat some of those of the assembly. And he put to death James, the brother of John, with a sword. And having seen that pleasing it is to the Jews, he added to take also Peter. Herod, and after having sought after him, and not having found, having examined the guards, he commanded them to be led away to death. And having gone down from Judea to Caesarea, he stayed there. Was and Herod in bitter hostility with the Tyrians and Sidonians? But with one accord they came to him, and having gained Blastus, who was over the bedchamber of the king, sought peace, because was nourished their country by the kings. And on a set day, Herod, having put on apparel royal, and having sat on a tribunal, was making an oration to them. And the people were crying out, Of a god, the voice, and not of a man, and immediately smote him an angel of the Lord, because he gave not the glory to God. And, having been eaten of worms, he expired. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, having fulfilled the ministration, having taken with them also John, who was surnamed Mark. In Antiquities, however, we read, Now, when Agrippa had reigned three years over all Judea, he came to the city of Caesarea, which was formerly called Strato's Tower, and there he exhibited shows in honour of Caesar. On the second day, of which shows, he put on a garment made wholly of silver, and a contexture truly wonderful, and came to the theatre early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it, and presently his flatterers cried out, from one place and another from another, that he was a god, a severe pain also arose in his belly. Accordingly, he was carried into the palace, and when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly, for five days he departed his life, being in the fifty-fourth year of his age, and in the seventh of his reign. Then we read, He, Claudius, was therefore disposed to send Agrippa Jr., away presently to succeed his father in the kingdom. But those freedmen and his friends of his, who had the greatest authority with him, dissuaded him from it. Accordingly, he sent Cuspius Fadus to be procurator of Judea and the entire kingdom. Then we read, Herod also, the brother of the deceased Agrippa, who was then possessed of the royal authority over Chalcis, petitioned Claudius Caesar for the authority over the temple and the money of the sacred treasure, and the choice of the high priests, and obtained all that he petitioned for. Then we read, Then came Tiberius Alexander, a successor to Phaedus. Under these procreators, the great famine happened in Judea, but now Herod, king of Chalcis, removed Joseph, the son of Camadus, from the high priesthood. And now it was that Cumanus came as successor to Tiberius Alexander, as also that Herod, brother of Agrippa the great king, departed this life in the eighth year of the reign of Claudius Caesar. Several famines occurred during the reign of Emperor Claudius in different parts of the empire. In the fourth year of Claudius's reign, after the death of Agrippa I, a famine occurred in Judea, as mentioned in Acts 11.28. The third famine of Claudius's reign was in Greece, 
approximately 50 CE, and the fourth occurred in approximately 52 CE in Rome. The above textual analysis of Acts and Antiquities describes the same period of famine in Judea, meaning that the king's country mentioned above in Acts could not be Judea, which suffered from a lack of food at the time. Therefore, confusion between which of the two brothers is being referred to looks to have taken place, possibly due to the presented closeness and similarity of their deaths. It appears Tacitus also confuses Herod with Agrippa I in his Annals of Ancient Rome. From what is written, they were likened to a god before their passing, and both died in Caesarea. However, Herod Chalcis fell ill when receiving delegation from Tyre and Sidon. Agrippa felt pain whilst watching shows in the theatre. Further, Josephus does not call Agrippa I Herod, but he does name Herod Antipas either Herod or Antipas, for example, in his Jewish Antiquities. And Acts calls Agrippa Jr. Agrippa. Herod is not a name attributed to Agrippa I by other early sources, such as Tacitus, Philo, and the Jewish Mishnah. The British Encyclopedia too states that Agrippa I was called Herod only in the New Testament. Josephus praised the moral standards of King Agrippa I, making no mention of any persecutions during his rule, although we must be mindful of apologetic bias. When Judea was again turned into a Roman province, shortly after Agrippa's death, Disturbances began when Herod of Chalcis was given the authority over the temple in Jerusalem. We have read then that King Herod of Chalcis was associated with an act of peace. Emperor Vespasian's reign is recorded as a time of peace. He even had the Forum Vespasiani or the Templum Pacis, Pax, constructed to celebrate the pacification of the East. Many works of art were transferred from Nero's Domus Aurea to the Temple of Peace. Coins were also minted in Rome under Vespasian that celebrated military victory or peace, as did Nero's. The name Vespasian, Vespasianus and Vespasius, therefore, look to be created titles. From the information found and connected, and for applying the methods suggested by Sir Ronald Syme, in his publication Emperors and Biography, Studies in the Historia Augusta, in which he gave 10 ways to examine the nomenclature of ancient history, the name Vespasius Vespasianus and Vespasian looks to be a created title using two components. Firstly, Vas becomes Bas, as the letters V and B are interchangeable. Secondly, the S in Pasius changes to a C, giving us the same word phonetically, but spelt differently. Pacy is a dative singular of Pax, peace a third declension. Vas, or Bas, is the royal abbreviation for the Greek word Basilius, which means king, and Basilisa, meaning queen. Just as Imp is short for Imperatore, Emperor, or Ses, short for Cesare, Caesar, and Pesi Us can equal Peace. Therefore, this peace word, used in the name Vespasius, can logically be deduced as meaning King Peace, or Roman Peace, because in the minds of the aristocracy, peace was guaranteed by destroying the opposition. As is known in academia, the Herodians were schooled in Rome, in the Roman ways. Agrippa II, 
was raised and educated at the imperial court in Rome. Regarding Herod Pollio as Vespasius Pollio, we have learned he must have had a son and daughter. The latter recorded as Vespasia Polla, the former currently being called Vespasius Pollio II. Could this son of Vespasius Pollio actually be Aristobulus of Chalcis, the son of Herod Pollio? Vespasia Polla, or Opgali, Julia Polla, Julia of Chalcis, Julia being her name through adoption by Julia Berenice, possibly, as a result of Vespasius Pollio's or Herod Pollio's marriage to Queen Julia Berenice, married a man called Titus Flavius Sabinus I, a tax gatherer in Asia and a banker among the Halveti. They had two sons, Titus Flavius Sabinus II and the future Emperor Vespasian and a daughter who died in infancy. The marriage of Vespasia to Sabinus I must have been before her marriage to Tigranes as Opgali, and, based on the data gathered, she must be the daughter of Herod Pollio and Marianne IV, who was born possibly just before or just after the beginning of what is classed as the Christian era, if her mother, Olympias, was born in 22 BCE. If Vespasia Polla was the daughter of Herod Pollio and Mariamne IV, it would mean Emperor Vespasian would be of royal blood, and anyone descended from him or his brother could then trace their ancestry back to King Herod the Great, and then also to his ancestry and that of his wives, including Mariamne I. This also presents us with a somewhat controversial realisation. It means the Roman historians presenting Vespasian as a military man of very humble origins, who had risen to become emperor, is an illusion. Vespasian's birth date of 17th November 9 CE as given by Suetonius, may also need to be reconsidered. Suetonius's identity is examined in my publication. The Synoptic Gospels state Jesus died on the ninth hour, and in the Bible, the number 17 symbolises overcoming the enemy and complete victory. Given this connection, Vespasian's birth date becomes suspect. Could he have actually been born around the same time as Agrippa II? If so, the following hypothesis, which is entirely plausible and based upon the data so far, is as follows. Herod Pollio, born 10 to 9 BCE, married Mariamne, born 1 BCE to 1 CE, in approximately 12 to 14 CE. Vespasia Polla would be born late 12 to late 14 CE. Vespasian could be born approximately late 24 to late 26 CE. This hypothesis is based on research presented by M. K. Hopkins in his paper The Age of Roman Girls at Marriage, Population Studies, Volume 18, and The Age of Roman Girls at Marriage, Some Reconsiderations by Brent D. Shaw in the Journal of Roman Studies, Volume 77. In his paper, on page 317 and 326, Hopkins states, We can reasonably suppose, therefore, that there was nothing extraordinary about these marriages, and that many other girls from the highest aristocracy and from the imperial family would have married within the same age range, 11 to 17, we can deduce that Tacitus thought Roman girls married young. Dio wrote that in Rome, the age of 12 was considered the right time for marriage, but Ovid wrote of 14 being a nubile age. And, whether pre-pubertal or not, girls' age at marriage was by our standards very young, 
and marriages were generally immediately consummated. The illusion, based on the evidence and the context surrounding that evidence, was that presenting Vespasian as a commoner gave the ordinary soldiers the hope that they too could perhaps one day become emperor, leading to their supporting of his bid for the throne. When Nero was assassinated in 68 CE, Lucius Livius Ocella Sepulcius Galba became emperor and adopted and named a nobleman Pisofrugi, or Lucius Capernius Pisofrugi Licinianus, as his intended successor. Galba's choice did not have a consensus agreement, and Licinianus had held no political office in Rome. Galba and Licinianus were murdered and overthrown by Otho, who was then overthrown by Vitellius. At that point, Vespasian's allies, which included Mucianus and Tiberius Alexander, began flocking together against Emperor Vitellius. To gain the support of the soldiers, letters were sent to all the armies, which likely promised modest bonuses and promotions. A letter, apparently coming from Emperor Otto, although most certainly forged and not accepted as genuine by modern scholarship, no doubt was seen as proof of endorsement of Vespasian for the soldiers, leading to a large part of Vespasian's support coming from Emperor Otho's troops. Although a claim that Vespasian's revolt was a response to the demands of his troops can be found in Josephus. Emperor Vitellius, a friend of Nero, who remained widely in favour with the common people in the empire, was too a victim of Vespasian's propaganda, with Vitellius's apparent luxury and cruelty being the focus. Tacitus repeats the propaganda of Vespasian by writing, Vitellius dozed away his time, quick to take advantage of the privileges of an emperor. He gave himself up to idle pleasures and sumptuous banquets. Even at the midday, he was worse for drink and overeating. By the same token, however, Vespasian remained behind when he revolted, leaving the fighting to one of his generals. We could argue then that if the propaganda was focused on him, would this too have been viewed as dozing away his time? Emperor Vitellius was portrayed as an incapable usurper, who was lazy and gluttonous but it is written that he was a former consul and governor of a province with an army, showing exceptional integrity. He was no saint, but looks to have been a man who was against slavery, even helping in a slave rebellion by rallying together the common people and slaves to fight for their freedom. Tacitus provides much information about who was on which side during the war. Nero and Vitellius appear to be on the side of the common people. Galba and Licinianus Frugi Piso appear to be on the side of Vespasian. As Tacitus writes, Neither Vespasian's desires nor sentiments were opposed to Galba, for he sent his son Titus to pay his respects to Galba to show his allegiance to him, as we shall explain at the proper time. There is confusing information about Otho, however, because Vitellius could not stand for him to be emperor. Otho may have had the same desires as Vespasian and his supporters. In regards to Galba, the legions under Lucius Virginius Rufus, a Roman commander of Germania Superior, during the late 1st century, showed their preference for him to become emperor over Galba. Again, Tacitus tells us that the armies in Germany were vexed and angry, a condition most dangerous when large forces are involved. They were moved by pride in their recent victory and also by fear, because they had favoured the losing side. They had been slow to abandon Nero, 
and Virginius, their commander, had not pronounced for Galba immediately. Men were inclined to think that he would not have been unwilling to be emperor himself, and it was believed that the soldiers offered him the imperial power. This informs us that Rufus came close to becoming emperor himself, as did Mucianus. The east was as yet undisturbed. Syria and its four legions were held by Licinius Mucianus, a man notorious in prosperity and adversity alike. When a young man, he had cultivated friendships with the nobility for his own ends. Later, when his wealth was exhausted, his position insecure, and he also suspected that Claudius was angry with him, he withdrew to retirement in Asia, and was as near to exile then as afterwards he was to the throne. But Tacitus goes on to say about Mucianus, that he was a man who found it easier to bestow the imperial power than to hold it himself. The footnotes of the Loeb Classical Library edition of Tacitus' Histories tell us that Licinius Mucianus had been consul under Nero and in 67 CE was appointed governor of Syria. After Thespasian claimed the imperial power, Mucianus became his strongest supporter. In conclusion, based on the data, we have to ask ourselves whether Vespasian was really of peasant stock, because the data disagrees. In reality, behind the scenes, Vespasian was of Herodian royal blood, if somewhat removed from and not as relatively rich as the current ruling family, but a facade of upward mobility, a metaphorical glass ceiling, was created. Past papers have given evidence of support for Vespasian coming from people closely connected by blood, intimate friendship or marriage. It seems Vespasian's royal genealogy was hidden through the use of literary rules, a mixing of languages, the meaning behind words and phonetics. If one was in a position to use these rules for their motives, an individual or individuals, an oligarchy, as examined by Sir Ronald Syme in his publication The Roman Revolution, could use them how they pleased. Examples include the Cetel form of inscription used in ancient and classical Greece, the Caesar cipher, and the 500-year-old secret code of King Ferdinand II of Aragon. The creation of titles, then, would become much more flexible, which is what is happening here. The aristocracy was in control of all publishing within the empire. They were also very knowledgeable about various religions, philosophy and the Jewish religion and had close supporters to help them. Although there was no specific rule in place limiting who could publish literature, the only people who had the means to do so were nobles, merchants and high-ranking people. In a book called Jewish Literacy in Roman Palestine, Professor of Jewish Studies Catherine Hetzer stated, Within the Jewish lower society, the average literary rate must be considered lower than the Roman average, significantly less than 10 to 15 percent, which perhaps gives us a figure of 5 to 6 percent. Rome's aristocratic population became experts in using many languages, especially Latin and Greek. The ones privileged enough to receive a bilingual education were children of the ruling class. In a paper titled Slave Education in Roman Empire, S. L. Moller states, I am convinced that its administration was as democratic as its curriculum was snobbish. For, as applied to education, liberalis means not that which is appropriate for any individual, but that which is appropriate for a member of an aristocracy whose only serious occupation was the practice of law. Latin was used for imperial administration and legislation. Coin Greek was for the majority of the populations of the Roman Empire 
which included the Jewish population. It was highly beneficial for members of the aristocracy to be able to understand more languages and how they worked. It meant not only would they be able to read many more books, it would also allow them to write using those languages, including the weapon of rhetoric, understood very well by the Roman elite. Of course, the use of rhetoric is presented within the New Testament scriptures, and a decent presentation of this can be found in the publication Rhetoric and the New Testament. It is clear, in my opinion, based on the evidence from primary sources, that the Jewish War, Antiquities and the New Testament, the New Law, were produced as supporting tools to aid the pacification of the East. Nero was portrayed as the Antichrist by later undoubtedly elite Christian writers. Suetonius paints him as the beast in his Twelve Caesars, and as Dr. Shushma Malik argues in her book The Nero Antichrist, Founding and Fashioning a Paradigm, scholars have read Nero into the texts. Vespasian's portrayal and promotion as a commoner was necessary, not only for himself, but also his immediate family, and his other close relations. If we argue that the ancient historians presenting him as having humble origins did so because rules of a higher level possibly considered those rules of a lower level as being peasant-like, then the description of his origins from a royal point of view could be considered accurate, but at the same time, the description is very misleading to everyone else, especially when we consider Vespasian was a patron of many future historians. He approved those histories written during his rule, making certain that biases against him were not published. Works were even destroyed. His brother, Titus Flavius Sabinus II, also recorded in history as Aulus Cecina Petus, consul in 47 CE, had a daughter with his wife Aria Clementina, also recorded as Aracina Clementina, or Aria the Elder, Senior or Major. The daughter is recorded as Titia Flavia Sabina, and she had married Gaius Calpurnius Piso of the House of Calperni, who is also recorded as Cessine Pete, known for the Personian Conspiracy. Titus Flavius Sabinus II's daughter is also recorded as Aria the Younger, a wife of Publius Claudius Flasio Petus, another name for Gaius Calpurnius Piso. She is also recorded as Satria Galla, wife of Calpurnius Piso, Cecinia Aria, and Livia Cornelia Oristilla, second wife of Emperor Caligula. Satria Galla can be viewed as T. S. Aria Galla, which is Titia, the feminine form of Titus, Sabina, the feminine form of Sabinus, Aria Galla, Galla being the feminine form of Gallus, which has the same meaning as Polio, as mentioned. So this marriage brings together the Personian, Flavian and Herodian families. Vespasian, along with his son Titus, and his Herodian and Personian relatives, won not only the military battles, but also the political and religious wars. I must note here that the son of Gaius and Aria appears to have been sent to govern Syria, a post that gave him control over the legions in Judea. This is recorded under the name of Sesenius Petus. The Jewish War describes the bloody warfare that gave the Flavians and their supporters the victory they wanted. We are told of the Jewish armies being outnumbered and killed, the systematic fall of Judean cities, the destruction of the temple, the dead littering the streets of Jerusalem, and the decimation of the farmland. Through these efforts, the ancient writers were able to describe the defeat of all of Rome's enemies and declare that Vespasian had brought peace to the empire, 
which led to him and his son Titus being described as the Messiah, chosen by the gods and as prophesied by Balaam. The man known as Josephus blames the Jews for destroying Judea and states God had sent Vespasian to punish his people. Suetonius and Tacitus also play along. But the long Roman Jewish war was as much a family battle as it was a political and religious one. Political propaganda promoted Vespasian's military victories, his supposed hesitancy to take power even though he elevated the status of his family to that of gods. Despite the narrative of them being simple farmers and his distancing himself from Emperor Nero, a man of peace, Nero was portrayed as a tyrant and the opponent of the righteous cause, despite Vespasian and Titus being the actual ones to crush the revolt. It was only when the man known as Gessius Florus added more sparks to an already developing fire of major rebellion that Nero eventually had to send in Vespasian, who he must have not perceived as being a threat to him. Was Nero any worse than previous emperors, for example Gaius Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar or Claudius Caesar? No is the answer. His crime was of being different, turning away from expansion through bloodshed. It is not difficult to understand why the Roman historians wrote against him. He was dedicated to athletic and artistic excellence, and his views and passions were not compatible with the traditional views of the Roman aristocracy regarding how an emperor and the nobility should act. His rebuilding of Rome required huge expenses and funds were confiscated from the high society of Rome. Therefore, he gained many enemies in the elite circles. The reputation the Roman aristocracy desired and maintained suffered a serious blow under Nero, which was deeply unacceptable to them. By Vespasian and his family taking control, one desired result would have been the controlling of the spread of information and threat of ongoing mass rebellions. The Jewish scripture was the fuel igniting the people of Judea to rebel. To accept any Roman as a god was unthinkable to them. There appears to be a hint of a previous effort to quell the source of the Jewish rebellion by appealing to Nero's interests. The Gospels are written in the form of acts and scenes. Act 1, Galilee. Act 2, on the way to Jerusalem. Act 3, Jerusalem. If this is the case, this effort may have been rejected by Nero, supported by the influence of his wife Poppia Sabina, who has been described as being sympathetic to the Jewish people. The reality of the situation being investigated here is that the number of converts to Judaism continued to grow. The control the Pharisees would have gained would undoubtedly have led to them being able to overpower both the Jewish and Roman aristocracies, and the system of oppression that was in place. Nero was viewed as weak and was the enemy, not of the people, but of the majority of the nobility, of which the family of Vespasian were blood relations. Jerusalem was destroyed, and with it the Jewish people's fight for a better quality of life. Once again, power was given back to those who desired it, through a collaborative family effort, albeit a hidden one.